The AL Central has been a wild division this year, so let's take some time to look back at some of my predictions and how it all worked out. We'll dive into it in this edition of Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are tuned into Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can find me on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. You also can catch us on wherever you get your podcasts. That can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, we're on Odyssey, and we're on YouTube. Just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe. If you're a first-time listener and you want to know a little bit more about me and this show, I am based here in Kansas City. I work at Sports Radio 810 WHB, doing some hosting, some co-hosting, and a little bit of producing as well. But when it comes to this podcast, when you click on this link, you know that you're going to be getting 30 straight minutes of Royals baseball. Today's show is brought to you by Booking.com. Booking. Yeah, the right state can make you a fan of any city, even your rivals. Book today on Booking.com the official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball. Get the Booking.com app today. We are dwindling down to the final series of the year. Uh, That'll begin hopefully tomorrow against the Atlanta Braves, depending on weather, which has been just an absolute disaster. Uh, Atlanta this week because of the hurricane, having to postpone the Mets series until Monday, where they'll have a doubleheader right before the Wild Card series. So it's been a mess in Atlanta. But hopefully the Royals, We'll have a chance to play tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday, because if they don't, uh, that would likely mean a doubleheader on Saturday when the weather does look good, and then Sunday. So the the Braves would have two doubleheaders in a stretch of like three or four days. So far worse for them, a game back of a playoff spot, than it would be for the Royals. But that's all assuming the Royals can take care of business here in a few hours and beating the Washington Nationals and sweep them before heading off to Atlanta. And we'll talk a little bit about that Brave series at the end of today's show. But what I wanted to open it up with was almost just um, a look back, summarizing what the AL Central was this year and where my predictions lined up with it. I can tell you this right now, my predictions came nowhere close. Um, They were bad predictions. And I don't remember if, if many of the listeners now, certainly not the newer listeners, because if you weren't following right before opening day, you wouldn't have remembered this episode, but me and the other AL Central Locked On host, and this was before Locked On White Sox did get a host, so if you are a White Sox fan or you stumbled upon my podcast, go give them a follow and go give all the AL Central hosts a follow. We got a Twins one, we have a Tigers one, uh, we have a Guardians one, of course, Royals and uh, White Sox. So we bring you the daily content Monday through Friday. Some days we will miss a day, but for the most part, especially right now in a playoff hunt, Uh, you're going to be getting five episodes a week. But back then, we did an AL Central preview. And I think all of us unanimously had the Twins winning the division. And there wasn't much of a pushback on that. I remember that specifically, that everybody said, well, it's a battle for second place, but this is going to be the Twins division. They won it comfortably last year. It didn't feel like anybody but the Royals significantly upgraded their roster. But even back then, a few of the the hosts were not completely buying in. And how could you? Because the Royals, you know, didn't go out there and sign Shohei Otani or anything like that. They stabilized their rotation, but I don't think anybody envisioned what Seth Lugo and Michael Walker would bring to that team. Uh, You certainly didn't think Salvador Perez would turn back the clock. You didn't think that maybe Bobby Wood Jr. would have a 10 plus war season. So for a lot of us, I think I had the Royals in third Uh, but also finishing right around 500. My season prediction was going to be 80 and 82. And I feel like for the most part, that was everybody else's guess, was maybe around 500 except for one host, and I'm not going to single him out, but he actually thought the Royals would finish in last place because the White Sox had a better farm system at the time. But of course, the White Sox are one loss away from setting the record for losses in a season, at least in the modern era, not going to, touch the Cleveland Spiders record, but they will likely touch the old 60s Mets record um, when they lost 120 games that year. The White Sox can surpass that with one more loss, which they are going to get either today against the Angels or against the Tigers this weekend. But the way this all 
went about was that the Twins were a first place team. And then we all basically said second, third, and fourth are interchangeable. Now, that might have been the only thing we said accurately. Second, third, and fourth are going to be interchangeable. And those teams are not going to be separated by a lot. He said the team that finishes in second place might finish like a game or two or maybe three games ahead of the team that finishes in fourth. And here we are with four games to go. The Royals being in second place are only two games ahead of the Minnesota Twins, who are in fourth place. None of us could have predicted the White Sox to be that bad. I thought they would be horrific. I did not think they would lose 120-plus games. Um, Maybe I should have taken that into account of there were no true big league players on that roster, except for Garrett Crochet and, and Eric Fetty and Luis Robert. But there were a lot of guys that just didn't belong on a big league roster, and that's how you lose 120-plus games. Now, for the actuality of this, for the reality of what happened in the American League Central, was that the Guardians got off to a hot start, the Royals got off to a hot start. But right when the Royals started to go on that stretch of winning eight in a row, the Guardians won eight in a row or nine in a row. So the Guardians used their bullpen, uh, the the youth movement to take this division and run away with it. And there were times that that division got close. In fact, the Royals just earlier this month, or might've been at the end of August. I think it was the end of August because Vinny got hurt uh, in that Houston Astros series in, the, series in the final week of August, but the Royals had tied them for first place. But other than that, the twins had a couple of moments where they were close. The tigers were never close to first place. It wasn't until now that they started making a serious push to the playoffs, and now they're likely going to get in. But it was a three-team race for the majority of this year. It was the Guardians, the Twins, and the Royals. And the Twins were ahead of the Royals for a long time. And then they couldn't stay healthy. The Guardians never really got bit by the injury bug, with the exception of losing Shane Bieber at the beginning of the year. Their bullpen just took all of the extra workload that the starting rotation put onto their shoulders. And they thrived with it. I thought the bullpen would wear down. That didn't happen. This is a Guardians team that if they can have a lead by the fifth of the sixth inning, they're going to win a couple of playoff games and maybe be able to make a deep run. So the Guardians are going to be good this year. They're going to be good next year. At least you would think so. Ownership doesn't really spend a lot of money, but they always seem to make the right trades and sign the right players. The Twins had one of the worst collapses I have seen. I don't think there was any point until Tuesday night that I thought the Twins were not making the playoffs. Even when they lost their doubleheader against the Red Sox on Sunday, I thought they still have a chance because of the Marlins and because the Orioles might not be playing for something. But now they absolutely are on the outside looking in and they are in a dire situation. And it would go down as one of the craziest collapses we have seen in the last 20 to 25 years in baseball of a team that was comfortably in second place to finishing in fourth. And the only team they're ahead of in the division was somebody that set the major league record for losses in a season, at least in the modern era. So you take that into consideration of the Royals. Yes. Crumbled. Uh, They had back to back or not back to back. Excuse me. They had two seven game losing streaks after Vinny Pasquantino got hurt, but they still have a two game lead in the wild card race. They have a half game lead over Detroit because of the tiebreaker with four games to go. A win today would go a long way in almost securing a spot because if they win and Minnesota loses, there are magic numbers down to one with three games to play. And at that point, I think we touched on this last night, the Royals would just either need to win one game in Atlanta or the Twins would need to lose one game against Baltimore. That would be it. And with the way the Twins would be playing, you would probably see their playoff odds well over 95%. Not 100. That won't be that way until they actually clinch it. And I told you last night that playoff odds don't mean anything to me right now. I do not care about them. All that matters is just winning some of those games uh, on the final stretch here. So the Twins have their collapse. The Royals have their collapse. The Tigers surge. And the Tigers were a team that I did think was going to be good this year because their pitching staff was going to be great. Their bullpen was great last year. The problem with them is, like Minnesota, They dealt with injuries, and their offense had a lot of key guys go down like Riley Green, like Kerry Carpenter. You add them back in, and they've been phenomenal. They have boosted this lineup to a level they didn't have 
back in June and July and really when Javier Baez was playing most of the games and since he got put on the injured list or DFA'd, whatever the hell it was, the Tigers have gone on a tear and they're likely going to be in. I will say this, when you try to use the argument of, well, look at the American League Central. They've got four teams fighting for a playoff spot. All four are going to finish with a winning record and you can just toss aside the White Sox. Well, I have rebuttaled with this. I do think it's a much improved division. That's undeniable. The AL Central is going to send three teams into the playoff picture. Nobody else in baseball, I believe, can say that. The NL West might if they can get the Diamondbacks in, but the Diamondbacks now are, are crumbling a little bit. So the AL Central, after sending one, kind of by default because they won the division last year in Minnesota, they're going to send three. And every team that makes it, had to earn it because though the White Sox were terrible, these other teams were pretty good. They've able they've been able to beat up on a couple other teams, but the records are a little bit inflated because the the Royals, Tigers, Twins, and Guardians got to play the White Sox twelve times this year, and the Royals went or thirteen times was it? The Royals went twelve and one. The Twins went twelve and one. The Tigers beat them up their fair share of times. The Guardians did enough against the White Sox, and you hope that next year they don't have a team that bad in the division. And I truly do mean that. I, the Royals were absolutely a, a benefiting team of playing the White Sox 13 times. They would not be over 500 right now if the White Sox were not on their schedule. Neither would the Minnesota Twins. But to me, the AL Central needs the White Sox to get better because it makes the division a little bit more stretched out. There's going to be teams that don't play well against the last place team. And in this case, everybody played well against the White Sox. And I think as a baseball fan, I never want to see a team like the White Sox in 2024 again. I never want to see it. That, that's just, that's putting a minor league team up to play against big league teams. And I don't think, and the White Sox are a Royals rival. Their fans don't deserve that. That's just poorly done on, on ownership and, and front office dealings, but also front office management can't do much if the ownership doesn't give them too much money. So the fact that we have seen a 120 plus loss team in 2024, that's just not good for baseball. So hopefully next year, the White Sox can be maybe just a hundred loss team or a 105 loss team that can be a little bit more competitive than they were this year. But my predictions are way off. I had the twins winning the division. I had the White Sox in last, everybody else interchangeable, but here we are. The guardians won the division comfortably and it looks like the Royals and the Tigers have the best chances to make the playoffs. And the Twins, of all teams, would finish in fourth place and out of a playoff spot. But still four games to decide that. It has been a wild year in the American League Central. We'll take our first break of the show. When we come back, I actually think the 2025 bullpen is a decent-looking bullpen, even if the Royals don't add anybody in free agency. I'll tell you why next on Locked on Royals. You are tuned into Locked on Royals and the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can find me on Twitter, Rex, at JohnnyJ underscore 15. Want to give a shout out to our first sponsor today in Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. It's also the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. And unlike other apps, on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks puts their members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When my picks hit, I can get my money in as quick as 15 minutes. Prize Picks also invented the flex play, which means you can still cash out if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money even if one of your picks doesn't hit. So download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked on MLB on and get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. That's code Locked on MLB on Prize Picks to get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive the fifty dollar bonus. It is guaranteed. Prize Picks, run your game. I think last night gave me a little bit of a a preview, a sneak peek, if you will, into who the Royals can keep around in 2025, and more importantly, stash away in their bullpen. Uh, you know there's a couple of new guys this year, and even ones they signed last offseason, that have an extra year of control. And it's a huge, huge relief knowing that the Royals don't need to spend a lot of money on their bullpen, and that's going to be met with some pushback from listeners and the comments I'm sure I'll get here. But you don't need to spend a lot of money to fix a bullpen. I think even in the Royals' case, that's been very obvious 
Sam Long being one of their bullpen arms was a minor league deal guy. You know, Chris Bubich was just a guy that came off Tommy John and they weren't expecting a lot from, but now he's their setup guy. Uh, Daniel Lynch's career seemed dead in the water until he returned to Kansas City about a month ago, and he's been great since. So when you are, you know, constructing a bullpen, the best case scenario is you find some hidden gems that maybe you stashed away in Omaha or they were a failed starter, whatever the case may be. That's the best case scenario because you don't need to spend any money. You don't need to go trade for anybody. And last year, the Royals knew they needed to completely overhaul their bullpen. They kept James MacArthur, and that was about it. Now, Carlos Hernandez didn't stick around long enough. He'll likely be on the postseason roster because MacArthur and Hunter Harvey were shut down for the year. But Carlos Hernandez wasn't a mainstay in the Royals bullpen this year, and he wasn't a mainstay at the beginning because he was hurt. So you took James MacArthur from last year, and on Hell Serpa, kind of, and said, we're going to go replace everybody else. We're going to go get Will Smith. We're going to go get Chris Stratton. We're getting Nick Anderson. You, you tried to piece together this bullpen with free agent deals. They traded for John Schreiber. They took Matt Sauer in the Rule 5 draft. I mean, they overhauled the bullpen. And it's always a gamble because for a lot of those guys, they weren't that good in the previous year. They were two or three years removed from their last great year in baseball. And it's not a surprise that some of the guys they cut bait with aren't pitching in big league bullpens. And of course, guys went on to succeed elsewhere. Bullpen pitchers do that probably better than anybody else. Colin Snyder was not good with the Royals. He's got a 1.31 ERA or something like that with the Mariners. You know, you, you look at somebody like Gabe Spire did the exact same thing. Richard Lovelady got better when he left. And it happens. Yoel Piamps, another one of those examples. But there's also guys like Dylan Coleman, who couldn't get it done in the Astros minor league system. Just something went wrong in his big league career. Josh Stama had a little bit of success with Minnesota and then was let go. Scott Blewitz with Minnesota right now. He's doing much better. Look, bullpen guys can do that. Sam Long was bad last year for the A's. He's been good this year for the Royals. It happens, right? It's easy to turn around a relief pitcher. But back to the point of what I think the 2025 bullpen can look like, I'm looking at about seven or eight guys, and I like what I see. And I'm not trying to feed into the recency bias. I'm not trying to you know, take away these great outings against a bad offense and say, well, this is going to be one of the best bullpens in baseball. Because what the Royals don't have, with the exception of Lucas Ursig, is a high-powered strikeout pitcher. Maybe Hunter Harvey can be that next year. If you thought Hunter Harvey was gone, he's not. He's under club control, and they'll have him for another year. And I expect Hunter Harvey to bounce back better than what he did uh, in 2024. You know, get him completely fixed. He can have a good spring training, and the Royals won't overwork him like the Nationals did in the first half of 2024. But here's who's going to be back. And if there is somebody you would want to replace, well, it's easier replacing one guy than it is five guys. And you can spend a little bit more money and get one of those high-powered strikeout guys. But we know Lucas Ersig is going to be back. He'll be the closer next year. Chris Bubich, I think, should be left in the setup role. I, I don't think you need to move Chris Bubich to the, the rotation. I think for the first time in his career, he has shined in a role for an extended period of time. I don't think that you need to go out there and try to lengthen him out. He looks great right now. The numbers are fantastic with Chris Bubich, and he's a cheap, affordable setup guy. So there's your ninth and eighth inning guy. We know that Hunter Harvey and John Schreiber are going to be back. They are under club control. They're going to be in this bullpen, unless for whatever reason, the Royals decided to trade him, and I don't envision that happening. So there's four guys. I think Daniel Lynch, if he finishes the year strong, and if the Royals make it to the postseason and he pitches well, I think he'll be back. And you don't even try to worry about stretching him out again. Even if Daniel Lynch says, I want to be a starter, I think you have a sit down with him and say, look, you're valuable in our bullpen. We're going to give you high leverage spots. And we feel like you could be that guy to get the job done. If he declines that, then I don't know what to tell you. But I think Daniel Lynch is pitching well enough that he's in the plans right now. So there's five guys. I think Angel Serpa will be in this bullpen. So there's three lefties and there's six guys right there. And then I think your seventh spot could go to somebody like Steven Cruz. I, I said this yesterday on Twitter, and you can follow me there at Johnny J underscore 15. Steven Cruz was quietly fantastic for the Royals this year. He was only up for a handful of games, 
He faced 18 batters, retired 17 of them. Didn't walk anybody, didn't hit anybody, didn't give up a single barrel. He's using a cutter a lot more now. He seemed to cut down the the walk rate in AAA this year. It was a big jump for him. And honestly, at this point, I would take Steven Cruz over Carlos Hernandez. So there's seven guys right there. And if you wanted to to contemplate an eighth guy, you know, uh, you could look into somebody like Evan Sisk down in Omaha, but that's just a fourth lefty. But again, if you wanted to go free agency and you felt like they were missing another big strikeout guy, man, I, I think that you could go with that instead of James MacArthur. Or maybe you feel like James MacArthur can be back in this bullpen or you want him over Steven Cruz. I get it. But that's what I like about this bullpen is that it's cheap. There's a lot of guys coming back for next year and you don't need to spend a lot of money on bringing in four or five different bullpen arms. You know what you got in a lot of these guys. And some of these guys have good upsides. So to me, if you go into the off season, regardless of how this season ends up and you go, all right, we got seven guys that we feel good about. Maybe we bring in one more else and we have competition in spring training or you barely even spend any money on it and give a couple minor league deals to guys going into spring training of 2025. That's how you got Sam Long. That's how you brought in Tyler Duffy, Dan Altavilla. Now Sam Long was the only guy that really you know, pitched well of those three, but you're throwing darts at a dartboard in the dark. One of those could stick and you didn't spend much money on them. Maybe they do bring back Sam Long. I don't know. Or Sam Long will want a, a one-year deal, a more... Uh, of a secure contract, even though a one-year deal is not. Maybe he's looking for a two-year deal. Not sure he'll get it, but the Royals got a lot of good options now where they just simply didn't have it last year. I know the bullpen hasn't shined this year, but right now they are looking good in the month of September, and a lot of these guys I would like to see back in the bullpen in 2025. We're going to take our final break of the show. When we come back, let's preview what is sure to be a wacky series in Atlanta coming up this weekend. We'll talk about it next on Locked on Royals. You are tuning to Lockdown Royals and the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can find me on Twitter X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. Want to give a shout out to our final sponsor and our title sponsor in Booking.com. Explore those cities you've always secretly wanted to learn more about. With hotels, bed and breakfasts, vacation rentals, resorts, and so much more on Booking.com, you might just find your perfect stay even in your rival city during the postseason. Maybe it's time to taste test your baseball's competition stadium cuisine. Luckily on Booking.com, you can find the stadium stay that's right just for you. With Booking.com's wide variety of choice across the U.S., you can go incognito to all of your rivals' cities. Booking.com delivers exactly the right U.S. stay for you. And Booking.com can help you book a stay that's close to your home team or your rival stadium. No matter what team you're rooting for this postseason, Booking.com can make you a fan of any city. The right state can make you a fan, even your rivals. Booking.com, booking. Yeah. This is going to be a chaotic series in Atlanta, and there's not a lot on this series in Atlanta. Usually, when I do these previews, I'm able to give you the pitching matchups, I'm able to tell you a little bit about the team. I have no idea to this point what this series is going to look like in Atlanta. How the Royals can solve a lot of these issues, even though the weather is out of their control, what Major League Baseball decides to do is out of their control. If they win today, they put themselves in a very comfortable position going into the weekend. Because if I'm not mistaken, even if the Twins were to win tonight, and I want to do this math in my head, so I apologize if this sounds weird on the podcast. But if the Royals win and the Twins win today, which they're both expected to, the Royals would have a two-game lead with three games to go. The Twins would need to sweep the Orioles, and the Royals would need to lose their series to Atlanta because that would be gaining two games, and the Twins would have the tiebreaker over the Royals. I think I'm doing that math right. If I'm wrong, correct me in the comments because I was not great at math in high school nor in college. Um, but that series can really, you know, take a lot of pressure off you if you win today. And of course, that's the focus because the harsh reality of this series is that the Royals are going to be taking on a team that's playing for their lives. But as I said last night, the Royals are too. It's not like the Royals have wrapped up anything or they're not playing for a playoff spot. They are. So these games matter to them as well. But whereas on Monday, 
we looked at that series in Atlanta as it could matter, it could not matter. Because Atlanta was hosting the Mets, and the Mets had a two-game lead going into Monday over Atlanta with the week of games left to play. But we also knew on Monday, in fact, I think a little bit before that, that the hurricane was going to give some problems to those games, that they might wash out some of those games. But yet baseball decided not to play any games on Monday. They played Tuesday, Atlanta won. So that put them in a position where they're now just a game back. Then they washed out the games on Wednesday and Thursday. So where the Mets were going to have to face Chris Sale and Max Freed, now it's likely the Royals are going to face Chris Sale and Max Freed because they moved that Wednesday and Thursday matchup to a doubleheader on Monday, the day before the Tuesday wild card. So one of these teams is going to be going to that Tuesday wild card game. And it's not going to be in their home stadium. They are going to have to pack their bags and go elsewhere and play the next day. So the Royals could have it a lot worse. Atlanta has it pretty bad right now. The Mets have it pretty bad right now. But I would honestly say that the Braves have it the absolute worst because they had momentum playing the the Mets, and the Mets didn't play well in Atlanta at all, and they were a game back. They had a chance to leapfrog the Mets and then take on the Royals over the weekend, but now they have to wait till Monday, and that game may not matter. That doubleheader may not matter because the Royals were to beat them once or twice, and maybe the Mets win once or twice over the weekend. So Atlanta really got screwed by Major League Baseball in the bad weather here. But we do know this. First pitch on Friday is 620, and I'll still put an asterisk on that because the weather doesn't look good. The Royals might have to do a doubleheader on Saturday, but even then, that's making Atlanta do a doubleheader on Saturday and Monday with the playoffs on the line. So how they handle their pitching matchups, I don't think we're going to know until Friday morning. And I will be having to do a, a pre-record of the mailbag Friday, so we won't have all the answers to the pitching matchups or what happens in the Marlins series tonight, who's the winner of that game, because I'll have to record it in the evening time. I'm heading out of town this weekend. I'm going to be doing so pretty early, so I won't have all the answers on that. But the Royals will at least be going into this, this series knowing who's throwing for them. They're going to have Brady Singer on Friday. They'll have Seth Lugo on Saturday and Cole Reagans on Sunday. Best case scenario is the Royals win today. The Twins lose tonight. They go into this Atlanta series just needing either one win or one Twins loss. And hopefully that would happen on Friday night or better scenario, the Royals don't play on Friday and then the Twins lose to Baltimore. Then those final two games, the doubleheader, the three games, they don't matter at all. And then you could throw whoever you want to throw. Start Carlos Hernandez. Start Daniel Lynch. Do a bullpen game. Call up somebody to start because your spot would be locked in at least for a playoff spot. But if you were fighting for the second wild card spot, I guess that does factor in there. So I, I walked that back a little bit because the Tigers, they're playing the White Sox. And maybe you do look at that. The Tigers are going to win likely all three of those games. And you're likely not going to win all three of your games in Atlanta. So at this point, it kind of looks like the Royals will be heading to Houston. You know, so that's that's the crazy part of this all. It's still possible the Royals can go to Baltimore, but right now I think the odds would tell you the Royals are going to be the final wild card team and go to Houston, and the Tigers will win their final three games against the White Sox, and they will go to Baltimore. So we'll see. Again, we'll see how that all shakes down, but this Braves team, they're going to be without Ronald Acuna Jr. That's been known for quite some time. Austin Riley is not coming back. And it's the Braves team that has done well enough this year with all the injuries that they have suffered. I mean, they have been riddled, at least offensively. They still have a couple of their top arms. They're going to have the Cy Young winner on the National League side this year uh, with Chris Sale, who the Royals likely will see this weekend because I don't think they're going to save their best arms for the doubleheader on Monday because that game may not matter if they lose any of the games to the Royals. So we'll have to see what Atlanta um, – is going to do with their pitching matchups. I bet that we'll know on Friday morning. I don't think we're going to get a definitive answer anytime soon. Prove me wrong, though. I would love to know what uh, the Atlanta Braves are going to be doing this weekend. But if you want to know some of the top guys to look out for, 
You know, Michael Harris Jr. is going to be somebody you have to worry about at the top of the order. Ozzie Albies, of course, is their number two hole hitter. Marcelo Zuna has had a fantastic year this year. Lots of power there. And Matt Olson and Jorge Soler round out the four and five spots. So there's five guys right there that you're going to have to constantly worry about all weekend long. The bottom of their order, uh, not as strong. You have the combination of Travis Darno, Roman Luriano, Gio Urshela was picked up off waivers. The Royals saw him in Detroit this year and Orlando Arcia. But for the most part, it's a lineup that is very top-heavy. They got lots of power, and they should be a very tough matchup for the Royals and their pitching staff. But the Royals have thrown 26 consecutive scoreless innings, so the Braves aren't necessarily too excited about facing this Royals staff and maybe two of the best arms the Royals have in their rotation. So we'll see what all happens in that Atlanta series. Again, first pitch on Friday, tentatively planned for 6-20. Well, that's going to do it for another edition of Lockdown Royals and the Lockdown Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. And you can find me on Twitter or X at Johnny J underscore 15. Thank you for making Locked On Royals your first listen today. For your second, find Locked On MLB. Prepare for the Fall Classic with Sully, who has it all covered every single day. Find Locked On MLB on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Tomorrow, we're going to have an early edition of a Mailbag Friday, so I'll be sending out my tweet. But if you do have any questions you want to leave on YouTube because you don't use Twitter or X, just leave it on this video. But until tomorrow, you take it easy, Kansas City.